Hi, everyone. I'm Mitch Wirtlieb, host of VPR's Morning Edition, and we really hope you enjoyed that preview of Muhammad Ali. It was really just a curtain raiser for what, we, what you're going to discover from exploring the entire eight-hour film. It premieres on Sunday, September 19th on Vermont PBS. And I'm so excited to be joined this evening by Sarah Burns, who in collaboration with David McMahon and Ken Burns, wrote, directed, and produced the documentaries The Central Park Five, Jackie Robinson, East Lake Meadows, a public housing story, and now, of course, Muhammad Ali. And we're delighted as well to have with us Jonathan Eig, author of Ali, A Life. I think you can see the book uh, right back here, at least I hope so. Let me bring it a little bit closer because it deserves an up-close look. Book by Jonathan Eig, and uh, we're going to be talking, of course, about Muhammad Ali uh, this evening. Um, he is, uh, the book, by the way, was named a Best Book of the Year by Sports Illustrated in 2018. And Jonathan Eig is a New York Times bestselling author and former staff writer for the Wall Street Journal. He's also written for the New York Times, the New Yorker Online, the Washington Post as well. Sarah Burns and Jonathan Eig, welcome to you both this evening. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And we're delighted to have you with us. I'm not sure how many people have uh, signed up or are tuning in right now. I'm a little bit new to the whole Zoom thing, so do bear with me. Uh, I will tell you now, if you hear my dog barking uh, during this broadcast, it's because he's a big Muhammad Ali fan, so you'll have to put up with that. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please type them into the chat box on the uh, side of your screen there. Please include your name and what city or town that you're joining us from. If you'd like to ask a question of Sarah or Jonathan, we would be happy to relay that question uh, to them this evening. Um, but we're gonna just jump right into this now that we have seen the preview of this incredible documentary. Sarah Burns, let me start with you because um, documentaries can sometimes fall into two kinds of categories. Like there can be an in-depth exploration of a person or an event that isn't really widely known. And then you, know, mm. you learn about it through the course of the documentary or the same done for a figure or historical happening that nearly everybody has at least some knowledge of. Muhammad Ali is one of the most recognizable figures of the 20th century. So why did his story to you warrant even closer scrutiny in doing this, this huge documentary? Yeah, um, you know, we actually started thinking about this project when John came to us, what, seven, eight years ago, <laughs> as he was working on his researching his Ali book and said, you know, there's so much here. This is an incredible story. And there's never been on film a version that sort of brings the whole story together. Um, and we knew he was right. Um, so Ali is obviously incredibly well known. Lots of people know a lot about Ali, but we felt like he was absolutely right that we never had something in a, in a documentary where we could bring all the different parts of Ali's life together and really understand the whole life and understand the man in three dimensions. And so there have been some great films that focus on a single fight or a single sort of chapter in his life. Um, but doing this bigger series, four parts, eight hours, allowed us to do the boxing. Yes, of course, that's very important, but also to do the spiritual journey, his faith, to do the draft resistance and his battle with the government and the Supreme Court fight, to do his family life and his childhood and the context. I mean, he's this is all playing out across the second half of the 20th century um, with so much fascinating historical context that's informing his life and that that's in turn, he's affecting what's going on in the country. Um, and so the opportunity to weave all those threads together uh, was too exciting to pass up. Jonathan Ig, your biography of Ali, uh, of Ali is a really great companion piece to this visual history. Um, why is Muhammad Ali so captivating, as Sarah was just talking about, to people who may not know anything or even really care about boxing? I think it's because the themes of his life um, are themes that are still resonating today. Um, in some ways, you know, more powerfully. And in some ways, we have a better grasp of them. You know, we're talking more about racism. We're talking now more about what it means to be a Black man in America and the duality of, of those of th that that identity um, brings with it. We're talking about freedom of religion. Um, we're talking about um, politics in ways that Ali was talking about um, very vividly. You know, he was really the first Black athlete to put these things in front of us on live TV and to force us as Americans to confront some of these issues. And the fact that it 
some of that took place now 50 years ago, gives us an, an ability to stand back and look at it with some perspective, with some historical perspective, uh, which is why, you know, Ken and Sarah and Dave were able to do this film, I think, in that grand kind of a scope, because the issues are still really um, alive in our community today. But you can look at how Ali um, experienced them with some historical perspective now. And I think that the point is a really good one about the fact that all those issues you were talking about were playing out in the media at a time when there was national television, of course, you know, now there's the internet and everything. We're even more connected in that way. But he wasn't the first uh, figure in boxing or in sports to have an impact on the culture. You think about someone like Jack Johnson from, from many decades before Ali, but those were, that was newspaper footage. There wasn't the, the video, the way to enter into you know, millions of people's homes via television. Um, and Sarah, that, that makes me wonder about all this footage that you found and put together in this eight hour you know, documentary. How did you collect that footage? What was the process that you went about to get uh, this incredible footage? Yeah, the process is a long one. And it, in, you know, it's something that we do, we do that research in house. So our producer, Stephanie Jenkins, is our archival footage master um, and her team and um, our co-producer, Tim McAleer, who does our photo research. Um, we spend years collecting this material, and that's in large part because our home is PBS that we can have these long timelines where we can actually have the time to find footage that nobody's seen before, to find the photographs that aren't just the famous ones that you've seen in Sports Illustrated or Life or um, you know on the news. And we're gonna use those too, but we're also gonna find stuff that I think even serious Ali fans haven't seen before. And so that process takes years. And that means going to lots of different sources, not just the obvious ones. It means finding, you know, we have some eight millimeter color footage in there that is from a neighbor of the Clay family in Louisville, where where young Ali Cassius Clay grew up and a neighbor, a doctor who was taking home movies. And there's this beautiful footage um, that no one's seen before. Um, there's footage that an archivist um, found that had been discarded by a production company. And then she, the archivist sort of socked it away and never, never looked at a box that said Ali on it. And our archival researcher went and said, what do you have? And they sort of rummaged around and ended, ended up being color 16 millimeter footage of the third Frasier fight that is absolutely spectacular that we scanned in 4K that no one has seen before. So there's some amazing stuff in there and it takes that amount of time to do the digging um, to find stuff that that is unique and also to do those transfers. You know, we get as much as we can. We go back to the original negative if we can and we retransfer everything so that it looks its absolute best. Um, and I think that also helps to bring out, sometimes you'll have seen some of the footage, but you've never seen it like this. Hmm. Jonathan Eig, where does Muhammad Ali in your mind fit into the discussion uh, about some of the most important figures in the civil rights movement of the 1960s? Because uh, Martin Luther King Jr. I think cited another sports icon, Jackie Robinson, as being one of the most critical figures of that struggle in the previous decade. Does Ali meet the standard in your mind as well? I mean, how does he differ also from someone like Jackie Robinson and how he delivered his message and how that message was received by the public. That, that's almost a trick question because Ali rejected the civil rights movement. As, as you know, maybe you're setting a trap for me there. But um, no, I wouldn't do that he, <laughs> he was opposed to integration. Um, when he joined the Nation of Islam, he made these famous speeches that, um, you know, bluebirds belong with bluebirds and redbirds belong with redbirds. And uh, he didn't want to white people living on his block and he didn't want to be living on white people's blocks and he did certainly didn't want to see his children marrying into white families right like he was not in favor of integration he he mocked the civil rights movement and only later when he um took his stand against the vietnam war did he find some common ground with martin luther king um so for most of his career he was an adversary of the, the traditional civil rights figures, just as Malcolm X was an adversary of the traditional civil rights figures for most of his career. But then as they matured and as the civil rights movement shifted ground, you see them discovering that they have much more in common 
than they than they might have realized early on. So I think Ali is a hugely influential figure in the Black Power movement, in the Black Pride movement, in um, giving voice to Black athletes, all of these things and more, certainly in the religious freedom movement and the anti-war movement. But civil rights movement, I got to say no. Was his... Uh... Was that sort of mindset then perfect for when he met Malcolm X, when he decided to to become uh, to embrace Islam? Uh, was that sort of ready made for him, given that mindset already? No question about it. I think Ali was a born rebel. Um, it's interesting because he's also a born people pleaser, and that would seem to be, um, you know, um, conflicting. But uh, he made it work somehow. Um, but that rebelliousness found its outlet when he met Elijah Muhammad and when he met Malcolm X. Um, he found a voice that spoke to him that said, you know, you can still fight um, on your own terms, just like he did in the ring. You know, boxing is a solo sport. He didn't like team sports. This was a way for him to really stand out from the crowd, to, to stand up for what he believed in, but to do it in a way that was really iconoclastic. I think Sarah also Burns, that he... Oh, I'm sorry, go right ahead. Oh, yeah. sorry, just to add something to that. I think also he you know, his, his embracing of the nation of Islam. And that started when he was a teenager, you know, he, he ends up with a copy of this record, a white man's heaven is a black man's hell that was recorded by Louis X, who became Louis Farrakhan later on. Um, and I think that he discovers this message of the nation of Islam. And I think it's helping him make sense of the world around him. He's growing up in segregated Louisville. He's clearly injured, pained by that experience of segregation. So he lives in a mostly black neighborhood that's a pretty safe space for him, but he's aware that there are places he cannot go, that a, a lunch counter, a water fountain, that there are things that he can't do. And that obviously is upsetting to him. And he's aware of Emmett Till's murder, who was just, you know, they were near the same age and that deeply affected him as it did so many people. And his father is a frustrated painter who's not, who feels that he's not getting the career opportunities that a white painter would have. Mm -hmm. And so all of this he's absorbing in his childhood. And I think the Nation of Islam gave him in that moment as a teenager, this way of, of helping him make sense of the segregated world that he lived in, which was to say, I'm going to embrace segregation and kind of make it, make it my own and make it, as John was saying, this thing that he, you know, he can be sort of um, rebellious and in control of in some way, um, instead of this thing that made him feel maybe powerless. Um, and obviously that does evolve across his life. But in that moment, I think it makes sense that that is something that is helpful to him. He always struck me as one of the most fearless individuals. And you're making it sound like he was like that from when he was a teenager. This, this was a guy who just did, did not fear anyone uh, and had such belief in himself, such strength, inner yeah. strength. Uh, we have this question for you, Sarah, from, um, we are getting questions now. I want to remind you, if you want to put your question in, put it in the chat box and uh, we will read it out uh, and let uh, our guests know. Uh, from Winter Haven, Florida, uh, Candace is watching and she wants to know, Sarah, how long did it take to make this documentary? Well, we were officially in production, I think, for about five years or so. Then we knew a couple of years even before that that we were going to make it and we're starting to lay the groundwork and talk to people. So really more than five years. Um, and that's, you know, there's a few phases, right? We, we begin by collecting things. We film interviews, we do research, we write the script, we collect the archival material and we sort of grow our library of, of Muhammad Ali stuff um, as we put it all together. And then we begin our editing process and we take that script, which is of course too long. And those, you know, five, we collected more than 500 hours of footage and more than 15,000 photographs into our log. Um, we use a tiny fraction of that material in the finished film. And so we then spend 14 months editing where we take all of this material and our script that's a little too big and we boil it down. And I know many of you, I assume are Vermonters. My dad always likes to make the analogy to making maple syrup um, that we, you know, we, we start with 40 gallons of sap and we end up with a gallon of maple syrup. But it's delicious. That's the it point. Is. It, it's it's the, only the best it. stuff that survives. So that painstaking yeah. process. Um, we have this question from uh, Janice in Starksboro, Vermont, uh, wants to know, I'm going to ask this to both of you. What are your thoughts on the movie One Night in Miami? That's assuming you've both seen that, uh, which I know is fiction, says Janice in Starksboro. Uh, and let's start with you, Jonathan. Um, 
my friend Kemp Powers wrote the play that it was based on, and um, I, I'm really fond of, of the writing and the work there. I, I, I always obsess over the actors, um, and I, 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 I'm struck by the fact that even the best actors in Hollywood have a hard time matching Ali's personality, his charisma, his, his sex appeal, his, his humor. It's so hard. It's amazing to me that even the greatest actors in Hollywood, even Will Smith, to me, falls short of matching Ali's magic. And I'm waiting someday for an actor who can do that. Maybe you have to do it by not imitating Ali because yeah. um, I, there was a lot that I loved about that film. But, and, and I thought the actor was great in many ways, but he still didn't spark that kind of magic that I get when I watch Ali on the screen. What was it about him? He did have this charisma. And, and, and Sarah, I'd like to get your thoughts on this too. Uh, the way he would, he would banter so naturally with Howard Cosell, for example, he always seemed to be so comfortable in front of the camera. Um, yeah. What do we know about his life that, that perhaps made him such, a, such an easily relatable star in that way, the charisma you talked about? Yeah, I mean, I think some of it is, you know, his is just, it, it's really just he was born that way, I think. I mean, I think he was always like that, even as a child, this big personality and this charisma and sort of bringing people in. I mean, his dad was hugely charismatic too. He was a kind of born performer himself. And so I think that that tracks, that makes sense. And he gets that from his dad in some ways. And his mom had this huge heart. Um, everyone loved her. And I think that that is also reflected in him very much the way that he was so generous with himself. He kind of, um, people who encountered him on a street corner for a few seconds had this story that they carried with them for the rest of their lives. I mean, he just, the way that he impacted other people is really extraordinary. I think the combination of those things, that charisma, that sort of natural performer's instinct, and that love, that generosity of spirit um, combines into something that I've never encountered, and I've never even met him, but I've never encountered another human being like that. And I think John's right that it's, it makes it almost impossible to imitate him. There's, a, there's no one else like him. And what did you think, Sarah, of, of One Night in Miami, assuming you saw it? Yeah, I, I, I sort of relate to what John said. I think it's, it's an impossible job to play. And I actually think Malcolm X is another person like that, who is sort of unparalleled and what an impossible task to try to embody him as well. What a huge challenge. So I think the actors did a very good job, but I also think it's so impossible to, to do that. I'm also kind of the wrong audience for it. I imagine, John, you feel the same way because anything that's a fictionalized account, when you're someone who's studied the facts of it and had to stay so you know carefully um, centered on the facts of the story, it's hard to watch something, even when it's a great story and really well done, that is you don't, you don't fictionalized. Room, you don't want to be in the room with us when you're watching anything. <laughs> no. We're just yelling at the TV a lot. <laughs> and a life like his, it, 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 that, that, you know, truth is stranger than fiction, that kind of thing. His life was, you can't write that. He did so much. He accomplished so much and was such an integral part of the culture of this country, not just in boxing, uh, that, yeah, I, th I would think that is really, really hard to emulate on the screen, even a fictionalized version. Uh, we have this question from Peter in Shelburne who wants to know, I was intrigued to hear about Ali's repudiation of Malcolm X, says Peter, was the primary issue with Malcolm's call for some level of violence that Ali was against. Mm, no, I mean, I think what happened really was that Ali was caught in between Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Nation of Islam, who was something of a father figure to him, and Malcolm X, who was a mentor in another way and a close friend, more like a brother figure. Um, and when Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad split um, for a variety of complicated reasons, you'll have to read the book and see the film to, to understand more about, about how that all happened. Um, Ali was really caught in the middle. And it was actually at that moment when Elijah Muhammad gave him the name Muhammad Ali. And I think that was at least part of what pulled Ali towards Elijah Muhammad and his his option I think at that time was you know he had to choose and I think that he chose Elijah Muhammad um, and turned his back on Malcolm X um, you know it's an interesting question to what extent that was based on fear um, but you know that was the decision that he made 
Jonathan Egg, um, what was the reaction uh, when Cassius Clay, as he was, that was the name he was given at birth, and then he changes his name to Muhammad Ali. What was the reaction uh, in the sports world among white Americans, among black Americans? How did people react to that initially? One of the things that uh, comes across really strongly in this film, I think, is that, um, sorry, there's a car alarm going off here. You can hear I that. thought it was going to be um, my dog barking, but that's okay, we'll get through this. But, um, the, one of the things that the film captures really well is the um, is the way Ali was was really hated for much of his career. Even before he joined the Nation of Islam, he was um, really picked on by the sports writers for being a loudmouth, for being um, cocky and not appreciating uh, what the white media had done for him. And then when he joins the Nation of Islam, it's it's uh, as if he has betrayed you know all the entire country. Um, so. It's 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 a seen as a revolutionary act. It, he becomes one of the most hated men in America, and that's before he says he won't fight in Vietnam. Then he becomes a traitor to the country, um, a coward, and and you know you can't even begin to to imagine today how hated he was because he's such a beloved figure now. It's difficult for us to remember, but when he said that he was joining the Nation of Islam, um, it was a huge. I think it's the most important moment in his life because he says that I'm free to be who I want to be. You don't have to. You, you don't have to like who I am. I'm going to say what I want to say. I'm going to be who I want to be. It was the Declaration of Independence. And um, for, for Black athletes at that time, that was unheard of. I think that's the moment that really um, changed the course of Ali's life. He really did put his money where his mouth is. I mean, because as you said, the, the follow-up to that was uh, he refuses to go to fight in Vietnam. And he has very strong reasons for that and he doesn't go but it really hurt his boxing career how much time did he lose uh in in boxing how much money potentially financial uh you know abuse did did that did that kid him with when he uh was was banned from boxing for a while yeah i mean he was out of boxing for three and a half years at the prime of his career i mean you look at the fights that happened right before that time before his exile before he refuses the draft and he is unbeatable. I mean, you, you, I think all just saw the Cleveland Williams fight. This is not long before he's exiled. It's one of his last fights um, in the, that first part of his career. And, you know, he is just, it's hard to imagine that anyone could beat him. It's sort of perfection. Um, and when he comes back, he's going to be a different fighter. And he's, he's lost three and a half years of his career, untold millions of dollars from both the fights and ever since he announced his membership in the Nation of Islam, in terms of the kinds of endorsements and business opportunities he lost because of that association, and then because of the draft resistance. And so he was, um, and I think he was clear eyed, go, doing the, both of those things. He knew exactly what he was giving up, what he was risking, he was prepared to go to jail. And as he said in the, I think another clip you saw, he was prepared to go before machine gun fire if he had to but he really was going to be, he insisted on being himself. And he was, as John was just saying, you know, he, he was free to be who he wanted to be. And he was going to um, stick with his principles and his beliefs no matter what. And he really did. He gave up a lot for that. The, the well, point I always want to remind people of, I'm sorry. What did he do in that three-year interim when he was out of boxing? He, well, he gave a lot of speeches on college campuses and other places, um, but he was, I mean, I think he, he missed boxing a lot. You know, he was always trying to find a way back into the ring throughout that period. But I mean, he, he went on this speaking tour just to earn money. Hmm. Yeah, he acted well, in a Broadway show for one night. <laughs> the show closed after one night. <laughs> That's incredible. When he came back to boxing, uh, and how did he get back to boxing, Jonathan? Uh, how, how did he get reinstated? Well, I, I always feel like I need to remind people that, you know, we say, oh, he lost three and a half years of his career. He was he, he didn't know it was going to be three and a half years. He, he really had good reason to believe it was over, that he would never box again. And that's the kind of commitment that he had to his religion. He was prepared to make that sacrifice. Um, but he was all that time trying to get back in the ring. Um, and uh, one of the things that happened was he was, uh, even while his case was on appeal, states all and, and municipalities uh, stripped him of his boxing license, refused to allow him to fight in their, in their locales. And there was no reason for that, except for racism and prejudice and, um, you know, patriotism gone amok, 
because um, plenty of convicted felons boxed. I mean, you, you couldn't really have boxing without convicted felons back then. Um, but Ali was singled out and um, he finally um, got the state of Georgia to allow him to box because boxing didn't, uh, Georgia didn't have a boxing commission. And then um, the ACLU appealed his um, case in New York and he got his boxing license back in New York. So he was fighting again before his Supreme Court, um, before the Supreme Court overturned his conviction. So eventually the Supreme Court did throw out his case and he was um, cleared of his, of his conviction. Uh, but by then he'd already found a way back into the ring. We have this comment from uh, Janice in Starksboro says, Ali was on a plane I boarded when he was older and he was smiling to everyone as they boarded. Loved watching his fights with my dad and brothers many decades ago. Cannot wait to see the documentary. So we've got somebody who is absolutely uh, just can't wait to see it. Same right here. Um, what was his first fight back, uh, his first official fight when he finally was able to fight again? The first fight back after the exile is the one in Atlanta against Jerry Quarry. Um, and that was in Atlanta because that was, as John said, the, the one place where he could get a fight in that moment. There was a, a black state senator named Leroy Johnson uh, in Atlanta who helped make that happen. He sort of realized that that was a place where that could happen. Um, but soon after that, he's fighting Joe Frazier for the first time. Um, and that is a big fight. That's a title fight. And he is, you know, this is where we start to see and understand a little bit about what a different kind of fighter he is coming off of those years. You know, he doesn't have quite the same speed that he used to have um, and that he's going to have to learn how to fight in a different way. He's also taking more punishment in these fights mm -hmm. now that he's back. Um, he's not he's not only not as quick in his legs and his speed, but he's also not quite as good at dodging the punches that he used to. I mean, he was almost unhittable before the exile. Um, he knew just how to lean back and get away from punches that that not too many people even hit him very hard before that. And now he's now he's getting hit. And it's a different kind of it's a different kind of boxing. Joe Frazier, I mean, we, we could do an entire uh, hour talking about him and his relationship to, to Muhammad Ali. I mean, the, the rivalry there was incredible. Uh, Jonathan, Ige, it was also a very difficult relationship because while Ali had that charisma we were talking about and was able to be so comfortable in front of the camera, not so much the case with, case with Joe Frazier. And what can you tell us about how Frazier felt uh, really unfairly treated by Ali in the media and maybe because he couldn't compete with him on that level. He could compete with him in the ring, but not in, in trying to, you know, one up him in, in the, in the bantering with the media, that sort of thing. Yeah. This, this film does not shy away from Ali's darkness and from his um, flaws and the way he treated Joe Frazier um, was really unforgivable in, in many ways. And Joe Frazier never forgave. Ali for it because um, when Ali was in exile, Joe offered him money, lent him money and offered him a job. Um, Ali actually asked for a job as a sparring partner and, and Joe said, oh, that's beneath you. What do you need? You know, I'll help you. Um, they were good friends, but when it came time to fight, Ali began using not just, um, you know, competitive, um, you know, taunting, but really racist taunting, using the same kind of language that the, the, the worst Southern uh, white racist used against, against Ali himself. And um, Joe was, was, was angry and confused. You know, why would you do this to me? My kids are being taunted in school because you're calling me an Uncle Tom. And um, it got worse, you know, by the second time they fought, um, Ali was calling him a monkey. And by the third time he was calling him a gorilla. And it was just um, really one of the things that Ali never, I think, properly apologized for and um, didn't seem to care or didn't notice how badly he was hurting um, Joe Frazier. Some of their fights were incredibly, just so epic. Um, but it is, it, it is sad when you hear about uh, Joe Frazier and that reaction and especially being called an Uncle Tom, that must have hurt him greatly. Um, there was never a point in Ali's career, even later in, in his later years, when, when you know he was suffering from Parkinson's, that, that he had any kind of, of regrets or, or come back to say anything about that? Yeah, I mean, he did. He did think later in his life, especially about the places where he had made mistakes. Um, and he did, I think, try to atone for those in some way. And, you know, he he did express some regret about the way he treated Joe Frazier. But I think it's true that he, especially at the time, I think didn't 
didn't acknowledge or maybe even understand how much he was hurting Frasier with that language. I think he was, you know, he thought it was part of the show and part of the, both the hyping of the fight and also the getting inside of his opponent's head. But he took it so much farther with Joe Frazier than he did with others um, to that point that was racist, that was cruel. Um, and, you know, Dave Kindred uh, in our film suggests that his, his theory about it is that Ali was, as he says, cruelest when he was most afraid and he was most afraid of Joe Frazier. I mean, Joe Frazier was the kind of ultimate rival for him. That is really, really interesting. Um, I also wonder about Ali's relationship with Howard Cosell. I think I mentioned him briefly earlier. Uh, Jonathan, can you talk a little bit about uh, those two again? It almost seemed like they were a comedy team at times. You know, they, they seem to know how to react to each other. And I don't, I can't imagine a, that kind of personal relationship these days with any one athlete and a sports caster or writer. Uh, talk a little bit about their relationship, Cosell and Ali. Did they understand each other on a deeper level? I think they understood each other in a brilliant way as both entertainers and businessmen. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think they had an intimate friendship, the kind where they were having each other over for family dinners but I think that they understood each other at a level that very few people understood either of the other because they were both really complex characters. They were both people who were outcasts in their own businesses in, in a way. And, and, and they also both recognized that they were good for one another, that you know, Ali could um, soften his image by clowning with Cosell. Cosell could improve his bona fides as a journalist because he had access to Ali like no one else. And they, um, they were just magic on the screen together in a way that was never, never felt um, contrived. It always felt like they were being themselves. And that's, you know, given how many times they, they, they did these gags, that's really remarkable. Sarah, do we see uh, some of that in, in the documentary, uh, Cosell, the, some of those things? Yeah, we definitely see some Cosell. There's some funny moments uh, between them. And, you know, I think it's it's definitely an important relationship, but limited in that way to this sort of, it, it's a performance in its way. And I think Ali, for all of his ability to perform, was actually really authentic. So even when he's clowning, even when he's bragging, he's really being himself. And I think that comes across in those moments. Um, they're funny and they're sometimes a little playfully antagonistic with each other um, in a way that was clearly uh, really endearing. We got this uh, question from Peter who says the film almost characterizes him as rather dependent or perhaps addicted to the adulation of his fans while at the same time stressing the great degree to which he cleaved to his principles, the rest of the world be damned. Is this basically just a paradox of a great human being? Peter wants to know. And I'll throw that open to either of you. Hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting point. I do think that he um, he certainly craved that attention always, um, and that was, I think, really a part of who he was, um, and something that throughout his life continued to be the case. I think he both understood the impact that he had on other people and understood, and there was that generosity of spirit and wanting to kind of share himself with other people and share that love. But he also, he gained something from those encounters too. And I think he really needed that. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting point. I guess it is one of the sort of contradictions in Ali. Um, but of course, everyone is complicated and has all these different sides. John, I'm curious about what you think about that too. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, and but what makes it so interesting is, you know, he he does have the elements of a narcissist. He he, he needs constant attention and affection, uh, which is partly why he had trouble staying married. Um, but he also wants to be a rebel. So those two things are in in stark relief. Um, usually, to be a rebel, it means you don't care if people like you. You're going to stand up for the right thing. But he wanted to fight. Uh, the, the power, he wanted to fight the system, and he wanted to be loved, and that would seem to be impossible, um, but Ali did the impossible over and over <laughs> he, he pulled that off, though, yeah. He was able to pull off a lot of things. I want to talk about uh, one particular fight, uh, and this was uh, something that was covered in another documentary called When We Were Kings, and this is 1975, when he fought in the country now that was then known as Zaire, and he fought George Foreman. When we think about George Foreman today, I think most people have this image of this, you know, very lovable, affable, 
uh, kind of goofy guy with the bald head, uh, you know, and just a super nice guy. At the time, in 1975, he was a fearsome opponent. I mean, there, there are images of him hitting the heavy bag and leaving dents in it. He hit harder than Ali. He, Ali, he was probably at the time pound for pound stronger. Um, and I think most people, is it fair to say, uh, Jonathan expected Foreman would win that fight, but he did not. What did Ali do? And I think Sarah was making a mention of this before, his, his speed, his quickness. What did Ali do in that fight against Foreman that uh, allowed him to win such a remarkable victory? Uh, this is my favorite Ali fight, I think, because he's fighting to get back the championship that the government took away from him. He's finally got a chance to become the heavyweight champ again. He's past his prime. He's fighting a guy he has no right to beat. He's fighting in Zaire, of all places. So it becomes this referendum of who's the, the baddest black man on earth. Um, and there's so much going on in this fight that, you know, as you pointed out, there's a great documentary that just focuses on this whole fight. But what Ali does to win is that he acknowledges his weakness. He acknowledges that he's facing a bigger, stronger man, and he he fights one of the greatest defensive fights in the history of boxing. He allows Foreman to hit him until Foreman is tired, and then Ali goes on the offensive. And it's it's beautiful. It's poetic. It's it, it would have been the perfect ending to his career if he had only stopped there and retired. Hmm. Uh, late uh, in his life, uh, he suffers some terrible health problems. We got this question from Candice. Uh, how did Ali deal with the health issues later in his life? Did he ever regret his years of boxing and all the blows that he took? I don't think he did. Um, he, he said that he saw his, his Parkinson's um, as, you know, a, both a blessing, you know, something that kept him humble. Um, and also he, he talked about it as a punishment for his sins. Again, going back to the things that he regrets and the mistakes that he acknowledged that he'd made. Um, but I don't think, and John, I'm interested if you have any other sense of this. I don't think that he um, thought of it as something that, you know, he, I don't think he wished that he had not boxed. Um, I think he, he um, you know, his daughter Rashida also said that he never complained. Hmm. He never complained about his condition. He just dealt with it and he continued going out and engaging with people and signing autographs and sort of spreading his love. Even when he couldn't speak anymore, he was still out there uh, signing autographs and engaging with people. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Sarah. And I think that he would have kept boxing if he could have. Um, and one, you know, one of my favorite moments in Ali's life is you know, after he lights the Olympic torch, and he lets the world see him in his in his current condition, shaking. He's only what 46 years old or something at that point, um, but he looks like he's um, you know 20, 30 years older than that. And uh, the next day, he talks to a newspaper reporter, and they said, "Well, how did you feel being up there and letting us all see your vulnerability that way?" And he said, "People are going to love me more now <laughs> because I'm just like them. Because we all get weak, we all get old, we all die." I think we're uh, about to wrap this up, folks. Uh, I could be I could talk to you about this all night, but Sarah, let me ask you this one uh, final question. You've put together this huge documentary with your team, um, and so it's going to be a tough question to to answer. But do you have a, a favorite moment, a favorite clip, or a favorite section of a documentary that that just gets you every time? You know, I mean, the end always gets me every time, no matter how many times I've watched it. But I would say that my favorite, one of my favorite clips is one that that you just saw, the what we call mechanical memory, when Sherman Jackson is responding, reacting to Ali giving a press conference where he says that he would, you know, that he's prepared to die before he would abandon his religion. And just Sherman Jackson thinking about the kind of example that sets for people. Um, I'm always really moved by Ali's courage, by his insistence on being himself at this great personal cost and standing on principle, even as he's, you know, not only losing his career, as we talked about, missing these years, the prime of his boxing career, but he's prepared to go to jail for five years. He's prepared to, as he said, you know, face machine gun fire. Um, and I find that very moving. And I do have to ask one more question of Jonathan I, because it occurs to me, Jonathan, that, you know, boxing itself is no longer the sport that it once was. It used to be one of the biggest nationally watched things in America. It's not like that anymore. Mixed martial arts has really surpassed it uh, in terms of people watching. Uh, given all that, given who Ali was, will we ever see another figure like him? 
I don't think we will for, for a couple of reasons, not just because of boxing um, fading. I and mean, when I was a kid, boxing was bigger than, than a hundred Super Bowls. Uh, you know, heavyweight championship fight between Ali and Frazier was bigger than, than all the Super Bowls you could line up. But the other issue now is that sports has become such a big business that the athletes are not, I mean, today we see athletes following in Ali's footsteps and taking a stand on issues. Um, certainly we've seen it in the NBA in the last year in ways that are really inspiring. But I still think Ali um, will never come again because the athletes today have are, are such big business uh, men. They have so many um, responsibilities. They, they can't speak freely to the press the way they used to. They can't have the relationships um, with, directly with the, with the fans the way they used to. And I just don't think that um, anyone will touch us emotionally. But maybe I'm biased because, you know, Ali's my guy. <laughs> Well, the documentary, I can't wait to watch the whole thing. Uh, I'm almost through most of the book. I can't wait to finish the book. Uh, it's incredible. Thank you both so much for joining us this evening. Uh, Sarah Burns and Jonathan Eig taking the time to chat with us. Thank you both so very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And we hope this conversation has educated you on the life of Muhammad Ali. There is much more to learn when Muhammad Ali premieres on Vermont PBS Sunday, September 19th at 8 p.m. It continues for four evenings. This conversation, by the way, will be archived on the Vermont PBS YouTube page. I'm Mitch Wortley. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in this evening. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoyed the documentary as well. Thanks again to our guests, Sarah Burns and Jonathan Igg. Good night.